I don't know. I think that's what makes me feel um, so certain that all that we have been through up to here is that you are the person for me because I was looking for. Oh my God. Oh my God. <laughs> yeah. Hey. Hey. <laughs> Damn it. We used to be kids. kids. Now we're not. We're not. Something happened in between. This is the Broken Youth Club. I don't know where this thought came from, but uh, do you remember the movie Dark Crystal? Yes. Okay, like it's this. Been, I mean, it's been a long time since I've seen it, but yeah, David Bowie. Yeah. Hell yeah. No. Wait. No. The Dark Crystal. The Dark Crystal. What am I? Oh, I'm thinking of Labyrinth. Sorry. Yeah. No, that, Dark, the, the Dark like, Crystal's the Jim Henson Muppets. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Whoops. Sorry. Yeah. I gave everyone a heart attack. Just yeah. <laughs> 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 yeah, I was mixing them up. Sorry. Go ahead. Um. Yeah. Do you know the bad guys, the like Skeksis or whatever? Uh. Yeah. You can yeah, picture yeah. it in your head. Mm-hmm. Um, when we did that filter on TikTok to show us what we looked like when we were going to be older, that's immediately what I thought I looked like. What you looked like? That was so. That was such a rude filter <laughs> that hurt my feelings so bad, and it. I knew it would. Yeah. I knew that it was going to hurt my feelings, but they're I, so depressing I, that they did um, it anyway. They, I get the idea of them existing for fun, but I I do think too many people use them as, oh, this is like, this is my actual, and then in the realest sense of the term filter for everyone yeah because you when you showed me a couple of them i absolutely thought you looked like a couple other people we know yeah and i was like whoa maybe i don't know what these people look like anymore yeah because it was like a carbon copy so i wonder how much of the filter is i'm seeing and it is yeah just from a a human standpoint of social interaction yeah. It is so bizarre that we have my God, I can go on the you know I can go on this tangent for for days, but this whole idea of <clears throat> we have our in uh in real life uh personality and then we have our online avatars, mm-hmm. which are so different than well, I won't say so different, but I think for a lot of us, we definitely it's an opportunity to clean our image and put out the best versions of ourselves and sometimes even a superficial, even better than better or better than best version of ourselves. So it's like an unattainable yeah. thing. So we're all living digitally when we're staring at our phones. We're lit. We're, it's, we're, I don't know. We're, we're looking at only avatars. It's yeah. not real people. It's, it's hard to explain. But. Well, that's where like some of those filters, I'm like, <clears throat> I can't even do this because I know that it's going to hurt my feelings. Because it's going to like contour my nose to look smaller than it is, or it's going to like gonna give you unrealistic get rid of my expectations. Like, yeah. Yeah. Circles. And then it's like, I'm not going to lie. When I was out in the gym this, like this evening, yeah. I literally like looked up, like, should I be looking at getting Botox or no. fillers or like where locally could we no. do that? And there's a bunch of places around here. But anyway, because you asked me today that something that kind of broke my heart was like, uh, what would I think if you wanted to get a nose job? Yeah. And I and my my instant reaction was like, I would, I mean, obviously I'd be supportive, but I'd be sad yeah. that you felt the need for that because I, I, I mean, obviously it's a part of why I, I love you. Like I, I like all your looks and the shape of your nose is a characteristic. I've painted you before. And so when you focus on the features of someone, that is a part of them. And so mm-hmm. like if I would then were to paint you again, I'd be painting a different version. And so not not in your heart, but a different, yeah. you know, avatar, <laughs> so to speak. Yeah. Sack. Well, yeah, but like caricature artists um always make my nose really humpy because it it is humpy. Like I have this it's my dad's nose. Yeah. And now it makes me want that hump to not be there. So I love your hump. That's why though. I can't even it's do those same, anymore. Because it's that the hurts same concept. It's the same concept of I feel like I've got like a little pug nose. 
I do love that thing. No, exactly. Look at look, no. w- listen to what you're saying to Our me. Our kids have your nose though, and they are so damn cute with those little button noses. I agree, which is why I've come to like accept and love my nose too. Like when I was younger, I absolutely didn't like my nose because. Again, like I, we had pugs. <laughs> like yeah. I looked at them, I was like, "Motherfucker, I feel you. <laughs> like, you can't breathe. I can't get girls. We're come on." <laughs> but no, it's like obviously it's part of me. I've also just and you know I've painted myself, and so if I were to change this, it would change me. It change look. You know when we've seen certain celebrities like childhood who've grown up, you know exactly who I'm probably talking about from a show we used to love. Had a reboot, changed their nose significantly, and it's like, wh- whoa! It, it that's not um, you. That's not what I've come to know you as. And it's, to be fair, it's, though, that new nose was also a little jarring. I don't know that I think it was done great. <laughs> um, okay, but fair enough. <laughs> but, anyway, but still, it, it it's the concept of. And listen, if anybody does, I'm not. I'm not knocking anybody who chooses to do cosmetic surgery or any sort of... Good, because it might be me. No, yeah, I I understand. (laughs) I I just... You asked my reaction. That's my honest reaction is supportive, but sad in the the aspect that you feel the need for that, that you don't have the acceptance of your nose. (laughs) I love it. Um, Also, when we were out driving, uh, you... You've been on this kick for, I mean, years, but also yeah, yeah, yeah. lately where it's like every time we get in the car, the only thing you're willing to put on is Toto. And I like Toto too. It's all good and great. But like when it's literally the only thing you put on, <laughs> I'm like, please literally anything else. And then you put on something else that is also Jeff Caro. And I'm like, okay, it's yeah. the same shit. Like, no. please, okay, listen. please don't. And then I ask you to just like put on something else. And then you start like, rambling about like the history of some i can't even remember completely what it is now because i was so tuned out but then as soon as you were done i was like hey do yeah, you know I like know. how sometimes when oliver just starts talking and we're yeah. just like mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. yeah but in no, the, our heads i'm like i literally i can't even be following what you're saying right now because i'm so uninterested in what you're talking about i know and sometimes i feel bad because it's like i bet you would love to have a wife that also really really loves toto and wants to like talk about all the things with you and i just i like that's okay because it's I like can't my thing do though. it sometimes we have our it's things like, you tolerate it and that's that's tolerate all, it that's all i ask yeah i'm like, not like mean no I, i'm not saying it has to <laughs> be your favorite band your favorite drummer your favorite music <laughs> universe everything but i mean listen i'm not going to take up all the airwaves but <laughs> Yeah, Toto's my favorite band. Jeff Beccaro, the greatest drummer of all time. Probably, <laughs> arguably, the most uh, <laughs> prolific drummer of all time. <laughs> of You're not out of screen. Yeah, I love how you try, she's Why trying to pick her nose or blow her nose. I'm trying to not stop <laughs> doing and why is this why is this happening why is this like this you're not you i love how much you try to get did. off straight screen you couldn't pull it off <laughs> yeah the fuck but my anyway yeah no so it drippy. it's my thing and i'm not expecting it to be your thing but i do appreciate how you let me just talk to a wall and it's like i know you're listening enough and you care enough <laughs> but i also know that you truly don't care i yeah. don't know i just try to bring Fun little fun. Fa- you know me. I've always been a fun fact guy. Yeah. And this is the ultimate world of fun facts for me. Yeah. This the the drum. My again here. I have. I have a little forty five. I brought mm-hmm. down. Mm-hmm. Uh, this is uh, uh, all supply the love. Mm-hmm. This is uh, one of their earliest yeah. uh, records. Um, it's a CBS original original sleeve. I got a bunch of these. They bring me so much joy just to hold them. Yeah. And look at them and feel them. And even, I know it's weird, but smell wow. them. I mean, that it smells like an old bookstore, you know? Sure. It's been around the world a few times. This came from Japan. I don't know. There's just something. I think there is a, a human uh, desire to want to collect things. Little trinkets, little shiny things, things that make us happy. Just yeah. little things. Yeah. And for the longest time... You know, I had unhealthy obsessions. Yes. And you know me, I'm a super obsessive person. I can't remember if we 
We talk so much outside of this show, which I think is also <laughs> something we should be a little clear about. It we I'm I often forget whether we have talked about this on a previous episode or if we just touched on certain aspects outside on the porch or whatever. But yeah, man, I, I think I think what Toto is for me is it's like a new obsession. It's yeah. a it's a healthy it's a way for me to have a healthy obsession that doesn't hurt anybody. Yeah. And and I don't know. Um I had written down, you know, I'd mentioned before, I do know this, that I have notes in my phone of things that I want to put maybe into a book or like a art coffee table book someday. And some of those are just points of wisdom. And one of those points that I was thinking about a couple of weeks ago was, you know, obsess over things that obsess and love you back. Mm-hmm. And to me, the this is the thing that loves me back so much as a uh, as a thing. You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, outside of my family, outside of like people, uh, a thing that, you know, act- doesn't, I mean, obviously doesn't love me back, but yeah, it is something that I know a lot of people now when they hear Toto or they hear a song or they hear the words or they hear Jeff Beccaro or they hear another song that he's in, which by the way, it's over 5,000, just so you know. <laughs> so if you're listening- If you were wondering. If you're basically, if you're listening to music from the mid seventies, you know, early eighties to the mid nineties, early nineties when he died, you're li- you're probably listening to him. Every major music artist, he has probably one or two songs with them. So again, super prolific. <laughs> <laughs> I have to throw that in there. But for me- I don't know how long I'm going to be on this earth. I like to have things that people can remember me by. Mm-hmm. And so this is a way that it'll love me back is when I'm gone, my kids will then, again, Toto is played on every fucking, you know, playlist. You you can't go a whole lot of places without actually hearing something. If you start to pay, it's like you ever like get a new vehicle and then all of a sudden you start seeing that vehicle. Mm-hmm. I guarantee you, you guys are going to start hearing Toto more and more, especially what you start know- knowing just how many hit songs they have because yeah. everybody only knows them as the Africa band. Listen, my ultimate Toto playlist is like 200 songs deep and that's just the, the ones I call the ultimate ones. Um, but yeah, no, when I, someday my kids will be out shopping with their family and over the loudspeaker they're going to hear a song and they're going to think of me in a positive manner. Mm-hmm. And I think that's pretty cool. I think those are the weird little idiosyncrasies that I can leave behind for the kids. Because that is a much healthier thing to leave behind than empty bottles of alcohol or yeah. uh, a dad at you know 30 years earlier than they otherwise would have. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So I know I have vices and I have obsessions. And I think learning to channel those into, you know, I know it's. Um, subjective on what's healthy but for me you know as long as I'm not spending a ton of money you know, like yeah. of our extra spending income on this yeah, you know, I try to keep it in check but that's obviously the only real downside but it it doesn't hurt anybody you know it's yeah. a, and I can go back to it again I can touch them I can put them on and I have a tangible We have, I have a, a record player system upstairs I like to that analog opening the cover Taking it out of the dust jacket, sliding it—you know—it's it's a whole yeah. process, and mm-hmm. it there's something that feeds my soul. And going back to that point, yeah, I think I'm—I don't know what it is, but I think I'm learning something about myself where I have these itches inside my brain, and sometimes I don't even know it's there until it gets scratched. Mm-hmm. And to me, that's what this—I've always, when it came to music. I've never been the person to just like, I'm going to listen to this one song and then I'm going to move on to this other random song by this person. And then, you know, playlist style. I've always, always been the person who will I'll put the album on and I'll just play it through. Mm-hmm. I want to listen to the album. It's like, I that's to me, it's like going and reading a book and saying like, yeah, I'm just going to check out like chapter 37 because it's like a good one. Like, mm-hmm. uh, and then I'm going to bounce over to this other book, chapter two. That's kind of my brain views music. It's like, uh, of course you can more with music. You can bounce around, but that's just the way I've always been with music. But this specifically, I don't know. 
I, you literally can put it on repeat for the rest of my life. And there's, there's something about it. And I, I don't know what it is, but I don't hate it. And I hope nobody else does because I think it does more for me than I think on the surface people may think it does. You yeah. know what I mean? Well, I think that you, I think typically whenever you have things that you obsess about. I'm going to put it back here so everybody can see I, it on YouTube. I mean, I bet they were really hoping they could. You know, just so, in case. Yeah, there you go. Sure. Um, I think that you have these like obsessions and they are specifically like coping mechanisms. And I think like when you were a little kid, your coping mechanism was like the Harry Potter universe. And so oh, you were man. so obsessed yeah. with that for so long. And we bought all these. I mean, we have like every Harry Potter book version extra thing. Listen, as someone who likes figure. collecting things, <laughs> I don't have every version and that that eats me inside <laughs> we have like so many Harry we have Potter a lot things, of versions yeah, and we've been true, to yeah. all of the parks and like it's our favorite place to go yeah and i think that I like have all my tattoos i don't know i should probably post them sometime yeah. but like, yeah like 90 percent of your tattoos probably are Harry Potter. 15 different ones yeah i literally have harry potter on my arm and i think that like that was a coping mechanism for you living in a house that was so uh just like kind of filled with like chaos and turmoil. Yeah. Um, it was like a good escape for you. And then I think as you got older and we had like adult responsibilities, uh, then I think that was when you like turned to alcohol to cope with just how like hard that season of our life was mm -hmm. and how much pressure you had on your shoulders to like provide for us. And we like had a kid pretty young and, Kind of like figuring out, like handling all of the weight that comes with adult decisions when we're really not ready to make them yet. Um, I think you were using alcohol to kind of cope with that. Um, I don't know what Toto's helping you cope with. I don't know if it's just like a, <laughs> it's a way for you to kind of calm down and like, I think you it know, is. just. I think it's just a, it's like a. Um, I think it's so like, um, it really pulls you in. There's so many things thing. going on. It's a centering thing. Yeah, yeah. So it's a way for you to just like calm down. Yeah, yeah. grounding. That's great. Um, but I think when it comes to, yeah, the coping with um, the alcohol, which is kind of what we were going to get into with, get into today. Um, I'm curious to hear like your kind of version of. <clears throat> how alcohol was first introduced to you yeah. um, as a kid and like the role that that played in your home mm -hmm. uh, and in both of your homes really. Yeah. Um, and then kind of how that transitioned into where we were at there for the better part of a decade really. Yeah. Well, I know my grandpa was an alcoholic, my grandpa Keith. And I know my dad had struggled with alcohol also when he was younger. <laughs> Um, you know, it was, it was something I knew of relatively early that it was like this genetic thing. I didn't quite know what that meant, but I remember being young, pretty young and having this vague discussion of, well, it's in my genes. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and then, yeah, my, uh, stepdad he was like the abusive alcoholic, you know, my dad, by the time my dad had moved on to his second marriage, he had stopped drinking. Um, and, but the drinking was very much flowing at, uh, my other house. Right. And this was, I mean, classic alcoholic, you know, hiding shit under the porch, you know, late nights out doing other shit. Um, and lying, going to, you know, NASCAR races and going to other states, uh, visiting other fam, like, or not fam, well, yeah, family members that we didn't know about. Um, it, I think alcohol ruined my stepdad's life and it killed him. I mean, it literally killed him. I don't, he wasn't that old. And so I say all that, yeah, just to know that it was a very, uh, I was very aware of it, I guess, very early. And there, I do remember at least one instance um, very vividly of my mom was working. 
again at the hospital and Darren had um, uh, some buddies over and he never, he rarely had buddies over. It wasn't that kind of household, like, like poker nights or anything like that. Like he was either messing in the garage or in his room or watching TV or whatever, you know, we just didn't have a lot. Of, we lived in the woods. I don't know. But it was one of those nights where, again, I think he just knew he had the window. And yeah, I had come into the kitchen to grab a drink, get ready for bed, whatever, something around that time. It was late at night. And he had done the class, you know, get over here. And then he was like, this, this, is, my, this is my boy. And this is, blah, blah, this, is uh, this kid's dad and yada, yada. And then, you know, he'd crack adult jokes that I didn't understand, but I knew they were inappropriate. Yeah. You know what I mean? But what I remember very vividly was, like, him pouring in one of it's those, um, oh, they're like neon, just the little plastic uh, shot glasses. Cheap ass. You know, you get, like, 16 of them for a dollar at Walmart or whatever. And I remember him pouring one of, I think it's still around. It's, it was called Hot Damn. And it was basically just cinnamon whiskey. And he made me drink it. And I was like, oh, no, no, no. And like, I remember the look in his eyes going from like, oh, this will be fun to if you don't do this, you're going to embarrass me and you're going to pay for this later. And I'm sorry, how old were you at this point? Oh, man. You had to guess? Seven, maybe. Seven or eight, probably. Was Stormy and Jeff home? Or just, was it just you? Uh, Do you I think my brother, yeah, I think they would have been. Yeah. But I think, so maybe it was, they would have been asleep or something. Yeah. Yeah, because I don't remember interacting with them. But okay. I do remember, I knew it, what it was because I had seen it in the uh, freezer. And and I remember do, taking, yeah, drinking it. Right. And it be, the, well, you know. <laughs> yeah, just terrible. But. I also remember it not being a big deal at the time to me because I remember it's like if it was okay for him to let me do it, you know, whatever. I'm sure I was, you know, didn't feel good the next morning a little bit or whatever, but that was the only time I remember being like forced to, I guess, from a young age. I just remember seeing him always mean and knowing that that's what it there it, it, there was a correlation of some kind. There. Yeah. <clears throat> and by the time I had met you in high school, I was very much like, don't even say the word alcohol to me. Yeah. Don't say vodka. Oh, it would just, it like, it send like these sharp pains back behind yeah. my ears of like, mm, like, please. Because words, I don't know. They, they, there are certain ones that, 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 for lack of better terms, they're like a trigger. They have, they can cut. And for the longest time, I had something with, centered around any sort of alcohol, especially like liquor. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I mean, I was, I, I had sworn it off as like a moral, personal moral code from a very young age. Right. And so all through high school, not a thing. All through college, not a thing. I It wasn't my thing until my senior year of college where you were gone. And I had gotten a gift. It was a real shitty, what was this? It was it, like payment for a job, right? Like they didn't have the money it to wasn't pay even, you. Yeah, it wasn't a job. It was like a, it was a, um, a favorite. I, I think I recorded a song for someone or something. But I got a gift. It, it, I know the friend. I'm trying to remember. Yeah, who who else was with him? But anyway, sorry. I I got uh, Admiral Nelson. That's what it was. Oh, God. <laughs> it was like the cheap knockoff Captain Morgan. I was. I yeah. knew it had a pirate. I just couldn't remember what it was called. <laughs> um, and so I was like, thanks. I appreciate it. I you know, I don't think they had much at that time to be paying for whatever I was doing. Right. And uh, so I had. I was living in that apartment that I had started my print company out of. Which, right. So there was like a living room. And then in the dining room, I had basically set up my whole print shop. Right. And one of the bedrooms was like where my counting and sorting area was. It was really actually a fun time. I, I look on that pretty fondly because. 
I had liked it. it. It wasn't an apartment. It was a house. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. It, it, um, was a, it was a little, what would you call that? Like a bungalow type house or something? Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And literally, you, I split it down the middle, like from the bathroom, and I, I got rid of the door so it was open concept. Yeah. And on the uh, one half was the kitchen, bathroom, and the living room. And then on the other half was all the bedrooms and the dining room. <clears throat> and I... Uh, or maybe it was flipped, whatever. It was a weird house. But yeah. basically the other half, yeah, was my print shop. And Ezio would spend time with me. And that's how I got my start. Like, I look back on that. I mean, there were certain parts. You were gone. That was shitty. Right. But, I, yeah, I was starting to deal with, um, I think things were getting a little bit heavy. And I just didn't know it. And so I, I do remember there was, it was a weekend night. I think a Friday, if I was right. Friday or Saturday, but pretty sure it was a Friday. Knowing I had a bunch of design work to do, but not a whole lot of print work to do. And so I knew I can just lounge in bed. I don't have to go anywhere. I've got my fridges stocked. I felt like I'm all set. Yeah. I don't have to leave the house the whole weekend if I don't have to. And I remember I had had that bottle now for probably a year at this point, like I was just keeping it as like a, as a relic, yeah. as a gift from a friend, you know. Um, and I remember looking at it thinking, all right, tonight, tonight's the night. I'm not going to tell anyone. I'm just going to, I'm going to crack that thing open. I'm going to lay with my dog in my bed and I'm going to make an attempt to get drunk. I, it was a very clinical approach. It was, I'm going to uh, open it up. I'm going to take X amount of chugs. Which, terrible idea to do with hard liquor. And then I'm going to wait an hour, and then I'm just going to keep doing that until I get drunk. And I remember I opened up, it was a uh, it was what, it was what a handle. So I forget how much at this point. I used to know all the math. <laughs> I'm glad I don't. 2.75 liters, something like that. <laughs> uh, and so I just, I grabbed it, opened it, and I just, just chugged. Probably like... Between a third and a half of this thing. Yeah. Just, I mean, obliterated way more than, because I didn't know what I was doing. Right. And it was, I had this really weird experience where it actually didn't work that much. I couldn't get the effect of it. I took so much so I even actually, my I called my mom. Um, <laughs> and I was like, hey, I'm actually just trying, I'm trying it out. Like, but I'm not feeling drunk. Is something wrong? And she's like, uh... <laughs> That's a very rare disease. I don't think you'd have it, but... Uh, She's also probably like, please stop. Yeah, yeah, that. don't. Yeah, <laughs> like, please don't. I mean, don't. <laughs> but uh, I think, I, yeah, it, obviously I finally did once I drank enough, but it was like a fucking lot, which we uh, now, you know, now looking back makes sense because my tolerance for literally everything yeah. is like Crazy. super high, Yeah, whether it's weed whether it was you know nitrous when i go to the dentist like whatever it is my ketamine treatments yeah. yeah they have to yeah when i go out to the bar with y'all i just i keep going because it takes so much that's why i don't drink that's yeah. why i went to liquor because beer was just like i could never keep up with the speed of which i'd have to drink them right to like be any sort of like real drunk yeah but i remember that was like a turning point of like i i did it and then I didn't really touch it for a little bit, even after that, because I wasn't, it wasn't until I think we moved to Kendallville, right? And then I started getting into like DeSorono at dinners and stuff. Yeah. And, but then we had the print business going. I was out of college. We had our first house. We were literally trying to do the all American dream. We bought our first dining room table set, which was you know, wood and beautiful, and we like loved the most that expensive thing we'd ever spent money yeah, on. Yeah, at that point, and we, you know, new couches, got the new car, the new house, everything. Yeah, and it was starting to sink in. It's like, oh shit, I'm not in school anymore. I'm not a kid anymore. Yeah, we have to pay for all this shit. <laughs> and like, yeah, to be candid, the first year that I did my print shop, like I did sixteen thousand dollars. <laughs> yeah, it was nothing, and yeah. I thought, yeah, we'll do this. God, yeah. I was so naive, but I don't know. I think there's a little bit of naive naivete that needs to go into trusting your gut of believing in yourself. Yeah. If I'm being honest, like yeah. I just, I had a, I, I've always had a feeling 
about certain things. Yeah. And usually when it comes to those bigger things, I, they pay off at least in the end. I may not be right about all the aspects of it, right. but the vision of the end goal, I knew, no, this is what we should be doing. You know, and, but because the next year it doubled and then it doubled again and we were doing well. But then the stress of staying with it and continuing to grow and continuing to chase that drag, whatever you want to call it. Yeah. Well, and got like real fucking heavy. When we moved from Kendallville back to Bloomington, that, that was, was that was it. That was where like things got really heavy. But I yeah. even remember moving from the Kendallville house. <laughs> you had this thing where you were like collecting your <laughs> De Serono bottles, basically, and you would have this idea yeah. when we lived in the house. Still because, a cool idea. Because I it, think. I don't. Maybe not. I don't. <laughs> uh, <laughs> because that house had a basement that was like partially finished. And you're like, no, we could like <clears throat> build a like a whole bar at like bar. I was top wanting, okay, yeah, I was wanting to do a bar top. And if these, you don't know what the De Serona bottles are, they basically look like a like a big brick. They're they're rectangular and yeah. square. They're not not any roundness to them really. And uh, I thought, oh, if we if we clean them out and flip them upside down, and then put those like angel lights all through them, or some sort of LED or something, right. and you stack them up. Has a really cool, you know, mid-century, yeah. you know, glass tile look. I don't know. I and thought, what's, what was crazy was the amount of bottles that yeah, you had it. accumulated. I'm to do it. Yeah. It was like, for, you know, I <laughs> when you first told me that, I'm like, dude, you're going to have to have like hundreds of bottles to do this. And you're like, <laughs> no problem. Yeah. I was like, oh my God. <laughs> so I think when we moved back to Bloomington, our bills literally like quadrupled and mm. we didn't have the business to really like yeah. cover that. And so that had first, to work harder. that first year that we were back was like, Really and then, fucking hard. listen, I, I don't want to make this a fairy tale, but my landlord was arguably the worst landlord I've ever I had. Was awful. You had like, you pay, you were paying a ton of money for this building that literally did not have heat. It didn't have running water when we got there. It wasn't insulated. You didn't have a bathroom. There wasn't a toilet. Like, it was awful. It was, it was basically so... an empty barn with two, the, the square footage of the lower side. It was about 3,000 square feet. The total of that building was five. Yeah. The lower side, 3,000 square feet. There was um, basically just wooden trusses, no insulation on the ceiling, yeah. cinder block walls, and there were two, count them, two incandescent light bulbs up about 18, oh, yeah, uh, 24 feet high. So then we also had like- we <laughs> It had was to like walking into a literal like shed. It was so creepy. So I had to put- shop lights on the floor blasting up at the lights yeah. or at the walls. Well, then do you remember we would take that um, like rain collector over yeah. to my mom's office building and we would fill it up with water dude, and then take it back over there so that you could like clean out screens. Because I didn't have running water. It was water. such a ridiculous It was DIY, setup. podunk, but, but I was faking it. Like yeah. my, my image, people really thought, well, I mean, my press was still like, a nice, very expensive right. press, and my like the everything, the operational part, but like behind the curtains, it was a oh, mess, it was miserable. And so you would, yeah, you would come home to this apartment that we could not afford, yeah. And um, Oliver was a baby; uh, he like turned a year old in that apartment, yeah. Um, and I was staying home with him because we literally could not afford oh, daycare; man. like that wouldn't have been a choice, even if I wanted to. Mm. And you would come home and you would just get like smashed every night. I remember. Yeah. Cause, and listen, I, it, it, ultimately it's my fault. Like I, I'm the one who drank the drink, the drinks. I went and bought the stuff. I used it as a coping mechanism. So yeah. I take the full responsibility. But if I had to put like a catalyst behind it, yes, it was the business and all that and the building. But again, we were put in a really bad spot by our landlord because- it was this whole mess of like, we had to do these upgrades. So we started to like take care of it. And he was really old. He was getting senile. So he would flip flop. Yeah. And then he would threaten to evict us for doing stuff. And then the next day, like, oops, sorry. Yeah, and I, by I was doing mistaken. stuff, you mean like literally getting a heater put in. Yeah. Like, right. Like trying to get with the city about getting someone down here to look at, yeah. you know, getting a, a permit. So a I bathroom. Can, <laughs> This whole thing. And then, yeah, he was like, I remember the one night he hit me with, uh, it was like $50,000 I had, I owed him by the end of the month, which was like, you know, like 10 days, 12 days from that or whatever. Do you remember that? Yeah. We got that letter. And I was like, 
literally like is is suicide an option like it was so fucking dark yeah at that time yeah and obviously i never really at that point i didn't uh per didn't think that far but right. it wasn't like a thought that fucking crosses your mind because it was so like, like what, what do, do i do? do yeah like we don't have because that. this dude is a, a rich old fucking property fucking goon yeah and racist piece of shit honestly. yeah he was awful. it was just such a fucking nightmare he uh, was awful. but anyway yeah i remember uh with again it was it was the winter that that was the worst part is it was the we moved in i think october right we did it was like right around halloween yeah from northern indiana to uh southern middle southern indiana yeah and he did not have that heater like until put March. in until March. Yeah. So there were so many the days where you whole winter where you would go in there and it would be like frigid, single digits. Like, I had a permanent that entire. I'm not kidding. Well, I have pictures to prove it. The entire winter, I had a permanent Santa Claus nose. Yeah, it was awful. It was. <laughs> I mean, it was so terrible. And I remember so many times you getting up and having to slog into work, and I felt so fucking terrible for I, you I because i was like, like i just <laughs> i don't know what to do and like what do we do when he's got us locked into a lease he made yeah. you sign like a it was like a multi-year lease right oh it was a three-year lease yeah yeah and yeah it was and like God. that's that was the shitty part too because like so much money man but when we moved into the building it was like hey this has to have running water and he was like oh of course y'all take care of it hey this has oh, yeah. to have a heater of course i'll take care of it and then he waits forever, and then he acts like we're supposed to pay for that when it's mm -hmm. like you literally said you would take care of it. It's in our lease that you would take care of it. Yeah. But we knew that he was so out of his mind that whether it was in the lease or not, he would have locked us out. He would have changed oh, the yeah. locks. Yeah, because he, he had some other goons. Like, because he lived in what Arizona. Yeah, and then he would have just like he had goons in town. That he would have, uh, you know, drug drug it out in court. Like he would have yeah. totally destroyed yeah, we our just life. Couldn't fucking. So it was like, what do we have to do to basically keep this dude at bay? Because he's so terrible. I remember and waking up multiple occasions, but one in particular that was just like so cinematically gut-wrenching for me yeah i think you know what i'm gonna say but it was oliver had what maybe like one one and a half right something like yeah. that because we yeah we celebrated his first birthday at that apartment we did and it was like four in the morning and i had to get up and you know as a business owner as a as someone who's doing it with not a whole lot at that time i was doing it basically myself i had no employees yet yeah it was just me Hello. Yeah. And I remember getting those comments of like, oh, must be nice. Set your own schedule. <laughs> yeah. It's like, yeah, well, you know, maybe. You're like, I'm fucking dying yeah, over you here. Get it. You don't get it because <laughs> it, it you do set your own schedule. But once it's set, you can't deviate from it because yeah. then, you know, you lose money. You lose opportunity. Yeah. Anyway, I, I, I knew it was like I had shit I had to do. And it was we need the fucking money that week so that I could literally pay. And it wasn't like I needed like. A couple hundred bucks. No. We needed thousands and thousands of dollars yeah. every week. And I was searching. I mean, there were there were points where I was like, I need fifty thousand dollars literally for the business outside of that example I just gave you. Yeah. Just literally from month to month. Like, I need to make I need to find a few jobs that are going to bring me in yeah. forty, fifty thousand dollars within the next ten days, please. Yeah. And somehow we'd always fucking pull it Oof, off. Oh my God. But then you'd get family who or family friends, acquaintances who would see the, you know, what you were doing and be like, whoa, that money's rolling in. It's like, yeah. And then it's going right back, right back out. Back yeah. out. <laughs> like yeah. I, I spent I sunk everything I had into that thing and it it took it all. And luckily, you know, it's still it's still alive as a company. Yeah. You know, I started it uh twenty eleven. Twenty eleven? Yeah. And it's still, you know, I'm still doing the thing, but it's structured different, mm -hmm. much different. I'm no longer the behind the press 16 hour days on my feet and doing that shit. Yeah. So that's nice. But yeah. yeah, to bring it back around to like how dark it got for me, I remember that morning of, again, okay, the four in the morning of sitting in Oliver's uh, little rocker chair that we had. The to, glider, yeah. Yeah, glider. And... It was so per like perfect in the worst way. Of it was in the corner, 
and there was a yellow street lamp right outside and it was snowing and it was i knew it was like fucking like two degrees outside yeah i knew what i was about to walk into my truck is i could see it it's covered so it's like going to be this process already it's for i'm dead tired from the previous what month two months whatever right and i you're in oliver's bed cuddling with oliver and that light is coming through just perfectly where it's like catching you the snow's coming down and it's just barely catching my face and i remember staring at you guys and thinking like please just let me be able to stay here today and please don't make me have to go in the universe whatever please yeah and it's just like this i was just begging so hard for something a fire yeah. <laughs> like an emergency yeah like it was this uh just guttural feel of like i i can't leave my kid right now because mm. it was my new, it was a new kid and i just had this just gut-wrenching feeling of you you have to you have to get up and you have to go. This is what you signed up for. Yeah. And this is where life gets hard, brother. Yeah. And you just have to fucking do it. Yeah. And I had those moments a couple times, but mm, man, just like that image is forever ingrained in my brain. Well, I think that's where it's hard too, because like mm. I could see you, uh, so miserable like I saw that and I felt terrible because it was like I don't know what to do to make that better I don't know how to fix this like hole it felt like we had dug ourselves into you know um and so I'm like watching you leave and then I'm watching you come home and I'm watching you drown yourself and I I don't feel like there's a way for me to like call you on it or try to stop you from from picking up another bottle or whatever, because it's like, well, God, dude, like he's literally doing everything he can. So if this thing is helping him relax, like I need to just yeah. let him have that. Yeah. But then it felt like it just kept getting to this place of like, it was so excessive. And it like, was, yeah. uh, and a lot of it was where, to like, keep me warm. If I'm being honest. Yeah. Well, I think, yeah. Whenever you were drinking at work and stuff. And what's funny is like when you would drink at work, that for whatever reason, I don't know if it was just because I wasn't around a lot for that. It didn't bother me as much. I thought it was weird. Mm -hmm. Like it definitely hit in a way of like, oh, you're not, maybe you're not supposed to drink at work, you know? Yeah, but but also, also like I built my own life. So I like I, all my rules are different. Yeah. Like you so, get to make the rules. Yeah, I do. <laughs> um, but then you would, but then yeah, you would come home and then it was just this like, I felt like I was alone all day and then you would come home and then I was still alone or I would like have to take care of you also. While yeah. taking care of Ollie. No, dude, I remember, just to interject, because I, I, I've been meaning to say this, I think, four times now. I When I would get home, I had this routine for probably, like, a couple months, if I'm being honest. And then I had to be like, bro, stop. At least I was able to stop that part. But I would get home. I would walk in the door. Typically, you, at that point, you would be with uh, uh, Oliver either you know feeding or laying down or whatever and you because i would come home kind of late at that point because again no exaggeration yeah there was two summers in a row where for three to four months i was putting in between 14 and 16 hour days seven days a week i yeah. literally i burned myself out. it was awful if i look back now i i'm very proud of like the things i'd fuck it i i wouldn't do it now right. i wouldn't i don't know how i did but I would walk in the door and I would line up literally eight shot glasses and I would, I'd pour them all up and I would just boom, 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 boom one after another. Right. And that was before I sat down to take my shoes off. Right. It was in the door straight to the bottle. Yeah. And, and you had already would, also been drinking it all day. Also, <laughs> I was literally, it was literally constant and it yeah. was hard liquor. It wasn't, I, you know, in the summertime, um, I would get a little lighter and, you know, we'd go with like just, you know, Miller light, Bud light, whatever, and just have the fridge stocked with beers. Cause when I did get employees, I made it, a uh, we, we drank, it, you know, no one ever got out of hand, luckily. Yeah. 
Um, I think there's a couple of times where someone messed up a couple of print jobs, but anyway, yeah. um, <laughs> you always had to redo them. So it's whatever. Yeah, you well, fixed it. uh, it's never, anyway, it never became like a huge problem at work, uh, in that sense. And only in my darkest days was I drinking like liquor at work. But yeah, I definitely, there were times where I would have a whole fucking handle underneath my fucking dryer yeah. right next to my press. So I'd, you know, spin some shirts and I reach right down and just take a swig and then keep going. Yeah. And that was just like, is the thing that kept me going and it kept me, I know it's cliche, but it kept me a little numb and literally again, physically numb because the temperature was so fucking cold. I have to use my hands because right. it's a very tactile business. You have to touch the t-shirts when you load them onto the board, you know, you're using your, your pinky and your, fin it's, it's a whole thing. Right. It really is. And when your fingers don't work right, that I means like trying to type on your phone when they're fucking freezing. It's the yeah. same concept. Like I would have to warm my body up to physically work and it just took a toll. And um, I think, how did I quit the first time? Well, so, so we moved into this house um, and we moved in with a friend of ours uh, and so he lived with us and then it was us and Ollie and we lived in this house. And when we first moved into it, we, I mean, we loved this house. It's still maybe one of my favorite places that we lived on the idea of like when, before we moved into it, By we basically, mm -hmm, yeah. we basically like totally renovated this house for these people. Like we painted yeah, literally we every room. Uh, we painted the kitchen. They like, were cool until we left too, right? They were, yeah, they were pretty cool. And then whenever we moved out of that house, like somebody broke into it while we were in the That's process right. of moving out. And I think that yeah. like, yeah, we talked about that. I we? remember getting the phone call about that. And he was like, Hey, I don't know if like, <clears throat> this is just how everything is supposed to look or if somebody broke in and ransacked place. And I'm like, well, we don't live in filth. So yeah, right. yeah, no, somebody came in and ransacked the place. Yeah. Yeah. Like not my fault. They broke into a basement window. Like, yeah, we're, we're, we're actively, week, yeah. yeah, we're like moving out. Like, I don't know what you want to do. Anyway, um, <laughs> I don't know. But anyway, so we moved into this house and our friend was like struggling with addiction and uh, he ended up relapsing while he was living with us. And um, so then he had to move out. And it, so again, it was just this kind of like time of a lot of like stressful things happening, like work stuff had finally kind of gotten okay like yeah, you were in a good better. rhythm you had we gotten had some, some big clients. clients yeah that were consistent oh yeah and um you were making it work there was fucking heat and a bathroom at that point hey, you know? like, there we were doing it i wasn't shit literally hey we didn't mention this i'm sorry but this is this is how bad it was for me i was shitting in a bucket for six months literally literally that's how fucking gross i was <laughs> because there was not like <laughs> There was nothing nearby. I mean, there was a brewery nearby, but uh, that was still like. Well, it was oh, like in the winter, you're going to fucking trudge over there. Yeah, I'm going to slodge over there down the street. And, cold. Yeah. Like, no, so it was it's awful. easier to shit in a bucket, y'all. Yeah. Sorry. Um, that's what it takes. <laughs> so, anyway, so we moved into this house and things were better at work. Mm -hmm. um, but we had this kind of stuff going on with our friend that was really heavy and hard. And your drinking had not slowed down. And I think having your friend live with that, like our friend, he was our friend. Yeah. Um, but he also, like, was a fun, you know? Like, we drank a lot with him, too, and it was, like, fine. Oh, yeah, our table for a while was uh, it's permanently set up as a beer pong table. Yeah, like, like we just... kitchen table. Yeah. House. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and so I think that your drinking had gotten so out of hand at that point, and then I didn't have this, like, friend that lived with us that I could kind of, like, bounce <laughs> these frustrations off of or, like, hey, fucking help me out here. Because, like... And also, like, this friend was kind of helping more with Ollie than you would at times because yeah. you were so <laughs> far gone and what and and your drinking and then um, were, yeah and he was on probation so he had to like you know uh pace himself I guess yeah and I remember having this conversation with him at one point because like when you would drink there were a lot of times where you would like lose your temper faster but you weren't like mean you weren't you weren't like a mean yeah, no. guy that would drink and then be mean. I was but the I type remember, of drunk who would normally I would just sit in a chair and just like stare at the TV. Yeah. And then just try to literally not move. Yeah. yeah. So you were like not helpful. Right. 
you know? And I remember having this conversation with him at one point of like, dude, I feel like Logan thinks because we've been together for so long that we are unbreakable. Yeah. But yeah. this has gotten so out of hand. And I feel like anytime I try to talk to him about it, he just gets really defensive. Mm -hmm. And I don't know how to approach that anymore. And then the friend relapses. And because they're on probation, then they get hauled off. You know, they don't get with those anymore. And... Um, and then we went to our friend's house, different friend, uh, for like a game day or something. We had, we had, That's right. we had Ollie with yeah. us and we went over there and we just like played board games all day. But you yeah. also, these friends were drinkers. Very and, well, they own a brewery. <laughs> yeah. And they like had really good liquor too that sure. like yep. we couldn't afford to have, you know? Yep. Um, just and so flowing. you just, yeah, you drank a ton. And I can't say no. You drank a ton that day. Can now. And I was, and I, again, Ollie was with us, which it wasn't very often that you would be like that with Ollie around, mm -hmm. um, in this kind of like belligerent way. Right. But you got super drunk to where like they had to help us leave. They had to help get you out to the car. Yeah. yeah. And, um, and I was like, I was helping you. And then a friend was helping you. And I was upset. Like, I was mad because, like, this is embarrassing. We have to leave our friend's house earlier than everyone else because you're so drunk. We have our kid with us. Like, this isn't a good look. Um, Ollie was, like, three or four at that point. Um, and I just felt, like, just really, really embarrassed. And I remember we were, like, getting you into the car. And you were, like, I just don't understand why you're being such a fucking bitch. And you had never spoken to me like that before, mm. ever, like not even a little. And uh, for you to say that to me in front of our friends and in front of Oliver, I just remember thinking like, oh my God, like, who is this? Like, yeah. Yeah. how do I come back from that? And uh, I didn't say anything. I didn't even react. I just like got Ollie in the car and got you in the car and drove the 15 minutes home. Mm -hmm. and you passed out in that 15 minutes. You just were zonked. And I I took Ollie in the house. I left you in the car. You slept in the car <laughs> that night. Yeah. And when you woke up and came into the house the next day, um, you didn't remember, you know, any of that. Yeah, of course. And so we just immediately sat down and I was like, this is what happened and this is what you said to me. And like, I literally can't do this with you anymore. Yeah. Like, I don't know what else to do. You like won't listen to me. You're so defensive. Like, but like, this isn't you. And I've never seen this part of you before. You've always loved me really well. You've always treated me really good. Um, and I just didn't, I just felt like at that point I was just tired, you know, like I was tired of feeling like I was taking care of Ollie by myself and taking care of you. And now I don't even have like our other friend, our other roommate to like help pick up the slack. And mm -hmm. it just, um, and so that was I I was like, hey, I think uh I think we need to like separate. I think that you need to understand that like I can I can't and I don't have to stick around in this marriage if this is how you're gonna treat me and if you're mm -hmm. not gonna listen when I'm telling you this has like gotten to this point of excessive. And so I was like, I think that, you know, the house that we were living in, um, it was finished, it was like a you know, upstairs and a basement. The we'll basement split level. The basement was um completely finished and like basically a separate living quarters like it had a, a smaller kitchen yeah. and it had a living room and it had a couple bedrooms yeah and so i was like i think that we need to separate um and i don't want you to move out like you can live downstairs i don't want ollie to know anything's up yeah i don't know what's gonna happen with us <clears throat> um but i just felt like i had just reached this point of like i'm literally just done like yeah. i can't do this anymore um and so i started going to beauty school um, to try to figure out like what I would do if we really were going to split up. Like I, I didn't have a job. I didn't have, you know, you had had the business and I needed to be thinking about like, if I'm going to, if I have to figure out how to do this alone, if Logan can't get his shit together, like I have to have a plan. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and we were like separated uh, asterisk, yeah. Asterisk, yeah, because we like we had these kind of rules in place, right? Like because we didn't want Logan and I. We've been dating for so long that we have only been like 
you know, really physical with each other. We're each other's only. Yeah. yeah. And like, that was really important. I I knew that if we ever stepped outside of, mm-hmm. uh, even during this separation, if it was like, if I crossed this boundary of like physicality, like I can never go back. Logan could never go back. Like that would have been it for us because this is like, you know, like it's not a normal thing to only ever with one person. Um, so we were separated on the aspect of Logan would live downstairs. Uh, Logan would have responsibility of watching Ollie, um, you know, like half of the week. And then mm-hmm. I would be the one uh, for the other half of the week. And so that like the days when you would have Ollie, I would typically try to like go hang out with my friends or go to my parents' house for dinner or whatever. And then the days when I would have Ollie, you always wanted to still hang out with us. So <laughs> you would typically come upstairs and we would just like watch movies in a very like platonic way. Oh, um, God. Yeah. Yeah. But you, for like the three months of like, I'm not even interested. I, I, I genuinely didn't know if we were going to get back together. I was just so burnt out. Uh, you didn't, you immediately stopped drinking. Like after that conversation, you cold turkey stopped it. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then for those three months of the summer, you poured into our relationship in ways that I hadn't seen you do that since literally probably high school. Like you would like leave me like flowers in my car. You would leave me like a joke and then you would like hide the punchline to the joke in another part of the car. Like you would bring me coffee in the morning. Like it just felt like you finally were seeing that like I'm a good wife to you and I've tried really hard to be a good wife to you yeah. and to be really supportive. <clears throat> and like, I don't, I don't deserve a husband that's halfway there. Yeah. Um, and so then after those three months, then we started to like allow ourselves to like date each other again. That was Mm -hmm. when it was like, okay, we can go on a date or we can like, you know, explore what it would be like to have the marriage back in like a marriage situation. Right. Um, you would stay upstairs sometimes like stuff like that. Uh, and then it felt like things kind of got back to like a good place. Uh, we moved into a different house. Mm-hmm. You stayed sober for a pretty, I want to say you stayed sober for almost a year, maybe yeah, a full I year. So. I think so. Um, I did. I wasn't really counting yeah. at a certain point. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I am now. <laughs> Which, by the way, uh, if you don't follow me on socials or the show on socials, I just reached nine months. Yes. Very uh, this week. So. Yeah. Um, feeling good very proud of you thank you um but our friend got like our friend that had relapsed uh <clears throat> had gotten out of their situation and was clean and back in our lives and that felt good to have like the support for both of us like to have somebody back in our in our corner and he like spent a lot of time at our house again and it just kind of felt like things had kind of gotten back to this place of like this is fun and also you're around like you're sober you're here the business was going well it just didn't feel like Uh, it lasted long and then well I think that we got into a couple of like hairy situations again where it was like we wanted to buy this house uh, but we couldn't We the bank told us we couldn't afford it you know our rent made it seem like we could afford it (laughs) But, um, and so we had to like have a co-signer for that house. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then we needed to have all this money to move into it because we weren't first time home buyers anymore. So we needed to have a down payment and, uh, we had hit like a slow season and it got really heavy again for a while where I remember a couple of times thinking like, I literally don't even know if I'm going to have enough money for groceries this week. Like, what do we have? Mm -hmm. Like, it just got really bad again in the process of us trying to buy this house. And I remember having this moment where I was like, please, if we're not supposed to do this, like, I need some, I need a sign. I need somebody to tell me that we aren't. And if we are, I need somebody to give me a sign and tell me that we are. Because Mm -hmm. I just am so lost on if we're making the wrong choice by trying to buy this house. Um, But we wanted a forever home. Like we want a space to, to raise Ollie and we wanted to be back in our hometown. And, uh, 
man, I think within a couple of days of me just like literally in my car, like, please, I just need some help. Yeah. The universe answered and we got a job from one of our like big regular clients yeah. that was literally within a couple hundred dollars of what we needed for our down payment for yeah. the house. Yeah. It was bizarre. It was like <laughs> the the profit we were going to make was yeah. literally within a couple hundred dollars of what we yeah. needed. Um, But that process was really stressful. And I think that that was when you kind of started like introducing the idea of kind of drinking again, but it's not full blown. Yeah. yeah. And then we got into the house and then we had this big deal in the works with this company. Yeah. That's a whole, that's a whole uh, like, separate and Story, we made all of these decisions and hired more employees than we had ever hired before. We built the mountain. And this was supposed to be like literally a multi-million dollar situation. And 25 a year to be exact. These people. <laughs> it would have changed not only my life and our your life, our kids' yeah. life. It would have changed my family's like for generations. Yeah. I was, you have to understand I thought I had made it. Yeah. I genuinely thought and I these people, fucking rule. <laughs> and I and was these wrong. people were like connected in the music scene and in Nashville. And they were like, we've cashed in. Highly recommended. We've cashed in our 401ks. Like we've put everything on the line for this. Yep. Well, surprise, surprise, didn't work out. Uh, like literally at all. Like their launch was a joke. Uh, literally zero jobs came in <laughs> for it. Lied about signatures. Lied about having signatures from uh, yeah, artists and managers thing. that they didn't have. We had to let go the people that we had hired. We were in this house that we could not, we like were b b barely affording. We had sunk basically all all of our and some of everything I had built to that point. Yeah, like all of the savings <laughs> the that we had. In. We had spent on this thing that then didn't follow through. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was so bad. Um, it was so bad. And I think that at that point, you just completely fell off. Oh, I crashed. And you were yeah. trying to hide it from me yeah. as if I couldn't see it. Um, it wasn't that I was trying to hide it, I don't think. It was more, yes. I think there's an aspect of trying to hide it. But I think it's more in the camp of I'm trying to keep my shit to myself because I know how if I let this get out of the container, it is a virus that will spread. It. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, yes, in a sense, I was trying to, quote unquote, hide it from you. But it wasn't like. You were flat lying to me. I Yeah. Okay. You were. Yeah, I was. So it's like I, un but I understand was, what you're was, saying. But I'm trying to get a little straight of it came from a place of I'm trying to keep my shit away from you. You yeah. know what I mean? Yeah. But Which just ahead, isn't sorry. realistic. It, no, I know. It, so truly, it truly isn't. It's not an excuse. And so it's you're like, stupid. But. So you're like lying to me yeah. about all of it. Um, and I know that you have it. I know. I can't see it. I can't find it. Which, by the way, we don't. We're very big on not lying. Yeah. And we don't lie about anything. So I'm and like, what are you doing? Like, where, who is this person? Yeah. And um, I literally like found some bottles in the closet upstairs. Like you were actively hiding it from me. And this was also right around the time when you started to, I think, have some like, you had said at the time that it was like blocked memories of the sexual abuse. Um, and so those things were starting to like resurface for you. I just had, it was, yeah, I hadn't thought about it in yeah. years. And then it's just like, oh, you start thinking, oh, yeah. And then it unlocks another. It's like this series yeah. of doors that just start opening. You're like, oh, shit. Yeah. And yeah. I remember this one night um, you had taken some cold medicine or something because you were legitimately sick. Yes, I was. And then you told me that you had just had one Mike's Hard Lemonade. Yeah. And I'm like, Logan, you are so fucking drunk right now there's no way yeah. there's literally no way that you had one stop lying to me and at this point we had had our second kid and so they like the baby and oliver were asleep and i'm so thankful that they were because i it must have been i think that this is what we were told that the cold medicine mixed with yeah. the alcohol that you had had literally put you in this state of you were you were so drunk that like you started hyperventilating on the couch 
You are literally... You were literally looking at me and saying, I don't know what's wrong with me. I don't want to die. I'm really scared. Like you were, you were panicking and I was panicking because I'm like, what do you fucking mean? You don't want to die. Like, what is that? And you were like, you were just hyperventilating on the couch. And then, it, and then you literally pass out like, and I had this <laughs> And I'm like shaking you and I'm like, oh my God, did he literally just die on the couch? Like, I don't, what's happened? And I ran into the, we had this like parlor area. I ran in there and I got some water from the sink and I ran back out and I threw it on you. And you woke up and you were like, <clears throat> you know, like, and I called your mom at that point. And this was like midnight, but I called her um, because I was like, I don't know what to do. Like something's wrong. Like <laughs> Logan's not he's lying to me. I don't know what to do. And she was like, call an ambulance. I'm on the way. And so I call an ambulance and uh, they come to the house and they're asking me like what kind of medicine you take and what you've done. And like, he's like, he's lying to me. Like he took this cold medicine, but he's saying he only had one mic. So I don't know what's happening. And they basically came and checked your vitals and everything. and was like, he's just really, really drunk. Like, he is really drunk. And while they were there and taking your vitals, you kind of, like, came out of it enough to get really mad that they were there. Like, you were pissed that these get guys were in your house, house. And you literally started, to like, get out of my fucking house. I don't fucking need you to be here. Like, you were so mad that they were there. <laughs> and I was like... No. I didn't know what to do. And I called my mom and my sister. They were there. Your mom was there. Um, because I was like, I don't know if I'm going to have to go to the hospital. Like, I don't know what's wrong. Um, and I just... That night was the the worst night of my life. Um, because you were so panicked. And so out of control. And I I couldn't even tell anybody what was really wrong with you. Because I because you were lying to me so I didn't know what to tell people I didn't know where you were hiding shit I didn't know any of that but I just remember it's like it just felt like we had finally like gotten to this place and then all of this stress happened all at once and it was this big thing and it just felt like and then you told me about the sexual abuse a couple of nights later and I'm just like what the fuck like <laughs> Like, this is so heavy. I don't know what to do with this. I don't know. I'm, like, so ill-equipped. <laughs> um, yeah. Because I knew you were hurting, and I didn't... But, like, we couldn't... You could not work. You know? Like, you couldn't I take did, a break. Yeah. You couldn't... You couldn't go off to, like, a treatment facility because we didn't have any fucking money. Like, we didn't... We, we were absolutely living, like, fucking month to month week to week like mm -hmm. you had you had to go you had to work but you were just like a sh like a shell of a person yeah um arguably my darkest time i think you know, I know obviously that night is a blur to me but i do you know i've had panic attacks now uh since several of them and I, man, I, I almost feel like I wonder if, I still wonder if I was, I know, yeah, I was drunk. But I also wonder if it was like a panic attack at the same time. But I don't know. I, there was something that, yeah, I just felt something broke. I think that. And it was, sorry, go ahead. I think it definitely was a panic attack because at a certain point, I mean, like when you hit that place of hyperventilating and you were like grabbing at your chest and it was like, you genuinely were having a hard time breathing, yeah. like, but being drunk and you're, and not having a whole, I mean, I've had panic attacks before. I would say my life more mild. They've gotten a little more serious. I think over the past, you know, few years. Yeah. Luckily, I haven't had one in a while, I don't think. Uh, well, that's last not true. Last time was when we were home last. That's not true. Yeah. No, I had a little one. 
Oh, and then you had the one, yeah. Not after that long I, ago. Yeah, Whoops. I, what, I, I yeah, 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 yeah. Never mind. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so that was really hard because it felt like you had just really fallen off at that point, and I didn't know how to steer you back in the right direction. And and I wasn't in this place of I'm ready to just fucking like leave. You know, like how I was we had before. Gotten so much because it felt like yeah. we had. Built, made ground. I mean, yeah, like we had decided to have another kid. Yep. Like, you know, we were in a good place in our relationship. And I knew, even though you were lying to me, I knew you were lying because you didn't want me to worry about it. And for me, it's like, hey, fucking yeah, cut like, the shit. Like, I have I have to keep the business going. I have to keep everything going. That's where it came from. Yeah. It's like, not, you know, yes, in the traditional sense, you know, you mentioned you're the stay-at-home mom. I go do the work. And we've had that. I, I don't, it wasn't in this, like, I'm the man, I gotta go, ugh, you know, but it was this, like, I. That was the way pride, that we built our family. It yeah. was more of a pride thing for me. It wasn't a man thing that I had to, like, provide for my woman and my my, my boys. Yeah. It wasn't more like that as much as it was, no, I have to do this also for me. Like, I have to keep going because that's what I do. And if I stop, I'm not me. And that's, I don't know. And and even it's still, that's the way it is now. You know me. Yeah. Like I I have, well, even this podcast. I mean, this is a side hustle. This is something that we're trying to get off the ground on the side of everything else that we're doing. Yeah. And uh, I always have to have something going. And I think that's a part of, yeah, going back to, just needing that like it's something that gives me comfort is if i keep if i see progress then i i don't i I can't sit in my feelings i guess i don't know yeah but um so then all of that happens i don't think that you would like i think after that you definitely cooled it on like the hard alcohol the hard liquor Mm -hmm. but you were still like it was basically like well what if i just drink beer and i'm like okay i'm in my mind i'm like what can i do I feel like if I tell him, we were he trying literally a different can't. like method of like last time I quit cold turkey and like did that work or did it work for a little bit? Yeah, like what so did that look we like? Maybe we were like, what if I? Because I always went back to the there's <laughs> there's a South Park episode where Randy <laughs> learns that he's an alcoholic <laughs> and he thinks it's like this debilitating disease. So he shaves his head, he's wearing a blanket, and he's in you know the wheelchair. He's like, you know, Stan, get me. I need another beer, you know. Yeah. He's leaning into the fact that it's it's a disease. And uh but at the end of that episode, there's a some wise wisdom that Stan always, you know, gives. Yeah. And uh it was, hey, you know, dad, it's okay. You can have a beer from time to time because if you completely cut it out, you're still letting it rule your life. You're saying you're you're ha- you're letting it have complete dominion over whether or not you do or you don't. Yeah. For, whereas if you say, "No, I'm going to have one today." You're having control over it. And for a while I tried to have that philosophy, and I think at times it worked a little, but most times it, I don't think it really in the long run anyway. Yeah. Did. Well, and so then like uh we move out here and you were like managing fine. Uh, mm-hmm. drinking a lot of beer, but you know what it was. Yeah, which again, that's what just, am I gonna do? Like, yeah, it, it, it was a to, beer's better than liquor. Yeah, that was it was a choice to like maybe I can wean off. You know, again, yeah. a different method. And but I do remember starting to see moments in this last house that we lived in, um, when yeah. you would drink a lot of beer because I mean you would you would drink like beers and know. seltzers. Yeah. You would be putting down like ten to twelve a day. Like you were, you were drinking a lot for a while, and there was a time when like I could almost expect right around six, six thirty, seven o'clock, you would start to like get mad. You know, like mm. you just started to become someone that was really angry again. Mm. And I remember we got in this argument one night, and I, I don't remember what it was about. I'm assuming. It was about the drinking. Uh, But we were in the garage and you got so mad that you threw your phone and you broke your phone on the floor. Like you didn't throw it like literally anywhere near me. It wasn't like that. But you were just so like 
overcome with rage that you threw your phone and the screen broke. And I was like, are you fucking happy? Like, you're like, I don't fucking care. I'll buy another one. And I'm like, no, you won't. Nope. No, you won't. Like, you would just. Which I didn't. I lived with. uh, Yeah. For a long time. Yeah. (laughs) But it was like, (laughs) but it was like, I was seeing these parts of you again. Yeah. That it was just kind of like, hey, this is, this is becoming an out of control situation again. And so then it was like, okay, well, what if I only drink when we go out to dinner? But then it was like. I worked for a little while. But then it felt and, but then it felt like you were kind of trying to make the excuse to go out to dinner so yeah. then you could order the drink. It was like in, yeah, yeah. It was, it was like, like in your brain it was every like every fucking this is how occasion I can get was it. a special occasion. Yeah. yeah. And so it just kind of got to this place where it just felt like ugh. I d- and like living out here was really hard for me to see you struggling with drinking again because we were so isolated out here. I didn't We hadn't made any new friends. Um, My family is literally 2,000 miles away. Mm -hmm. And the only friends that I had were the people that you worked with. So I can't call my, I can't call my friend that you work with because then I'm telling her that my husband. Hey, this Logan's probably drunk in the office right now. (laughs) You should, yeah. Which to be, uh, again, no blame. I'm the one who took the. There was a little bit of influence, I think, on that last run of uh, yeah. in-office drinking. Correct. Which, um, again, I cracked the tab. I poured the drink. But there was not... It wasn't a zero-influence situation, I right. should say. Yeah. And I I let that happen for sure. Yeah. Um, but then I feel like it just... We knew that it was getting out of hand again and... Uh, And I had reached out to a friend of mine that is an NP um, because we wanted to get you back on Adderall because you had been off of it for a while. Mm -hmm. And we were like, hey, like maybe if we get going with the Adderall again, maybe that will help you not feel like you need to drink to deal with like all of the fucking responsibilities that you have. Because you immediately had a lot more responsibility than we anticipated. And yeah. And you took a lot of pride in that. That was great for you. But it was like, Still it was just a lot of pressure, right? And mm-hmm. you didn't want to fuck up. And it was just hard. That first year and a half that we were out here was just really hard um, to kind of, you had never even Acclimate, worked for, yeah. yeah, you had like never even worked in an office setting before like I've that. I've never worked. I literally, the only, so I grew up working for dad. Yeah. And then in high school for literally four days, I worked for someone else in Bloomington and on the on the fourth day. I went into his office. I was like, "Hey, man, I'm just not. <laughs> yeah. I'm not feeling this. Yeah, and, uh, I'm not making enough money." And then he started arguing with me. He's like, he broke out a calculator and was like, "Well, if you, you know, gas is this," and I was like, eh, eh, eh. "I'm yeah. not going to have you tell me whether or not I'm making enough money." <laughs> yeah. Not feeling it. I didn't last a week. I yeah. quit, and I went right back to dad. And honestly, at that moment, it was it's more of a reconnaissance type job because dad was in the sign business. I was trying to learn from a bigger sign shop so I can bring it back to dad, you know, yeah. which I did. Yeah. It worked. Yeah. You're welcome, <laughs> Joe. Um, Love you, dad. But, but um, so I'd reach out to this friend. I was like, hey, like, do you have any recommendations for mm-hmm. a doctor that Logan can use? Because the one that we had seen a couple of times mm-hmm. since we had been out here. It was a bitch. And was like very judgy about you. Sm- oh, dude, I was a meth head to About her. you smoking weed. Yeah, it was dude. like, well, if you smoke weed, I can't give you Adderall. Fuck and off. it's like, literally, I am such an advocate for fucking medicinal weed yeah. because I see how you can take it. And it literally does just like calm you down. And I think it really helps with that kind of like manic side of your ADHD where mm-hmm. you have like a hard time getting out of your head. Mm-hmm. Um, or a hard time not obsessing over certain things. And it's like, Re- I think that- Replaying the same like thought in your head. Yeah. And, yeah. and yeah. so I think that like weed for you is a very grounding and calming experience. <sighs> yep. But she made you feel like you were literally- Shooting up in an alley and then coming in and being like, hey, help me out. Yeah. So- yeah. Fuck off, man. I was like, hey, do you have a recommendation? Because this just isn't working out. And um, my friend was like, well, have you ever looked into ketamine treatment? Mm-hmm. And I didn't even know what that was. And I shot it off to you and you were like, special K, I've heard of ketamine. And I'm like, <laughs> I'm like okay, well, I don't think it's like, like that. Yeah. Um, 
but there just happened to be a ketamine treatment center yeah. in yep. Spokane. Um, and so we looked into it <clears throat> and it was a pretty big investment um, for that initial because you have to go a certain amount of times for like six yeah, weeks or something. Is, I understand if I it's ever... It's like initially a very big investment. Mm -hmm. But my friend was like, my, you know, another friend of mine owns a ketamine clinic in I think it was maybe Arizona or something. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the the science behind ketamine treatment... Top notch. With Promising. treating depression yep. and PTSD and like trauma and all of this stuff. It's like the 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 science is there. And yep. I think that you should look into it. And I remember coming home and we watched a docu like a little documentary that we found on ketamine and how it literally is like, it heals you in yeah, a way that like depression meds kind of mm -hmm. like aid in it. But it's like, if you're on depression meds, typically it's like, well, you're just going to be on them for the rest of your yeah. life now. Just but ketamine treatment is supposed fixing. to be a thing that like, yeah, you do it yeah. and then you might need to just do... Uh, one treatment a year after Maybe, that like yeah. you know it, you get to this point where the ketamine is is healing these things for you in your brain and how your brain works so that in the long run you won't need it very much at yeah, all yeah the way okay so real quick the way i've kind of heard it explained to me which i think is a wonderful explanation is imagine all the synapses on your brain that uh send electrical signals back and forth to each other telling you to do this or feel this Imagine over time, imagine those synapses as like little flowers and over time they just shrink and they shrivel and they kind of get withered and they, yeah, they shrink up. And what ketamine does is it goes in, sprinkles some water on them, rejuvenates them and lets them kind of rebloom a little bit. And then they can shoot those signals more efficiently. So you're yeah. thinking faster, you're less clogged down. And yeah, so for me, my experience was, and then again, again, I want to be very careful, legally speaking here, this is just my experience. So if you, I always say, you one, to get into a clinic, you have to have a doctor or an NP recommendation anyway. So please right. talk to your doctor, see if this even is something that would work for you, because it, I, I don't know if it's for everyone, but but I do know the, the research is pretty promising. But yeah. for me, I went in... To, it was pr very easy. It didn't take that long to get approved and get in. Yeah. And uh, my original routine was, I think it was six sessions, right? Or was it five? I think it's six sessions. And I think, I think I lied. I think it's, uh, I think it was three weeks, three or four. I think it was three. And they wanted you to come camp, in. Yeah. And they wanted you to come in twice a week. Twice a week. Yeah. But these sessions are kind of long. And it, at the time we were living in Coeur d'Alene. And so the, the office was like a 45 minute drive. Mm -hmm. So for you to miss essentially half a day of work twice well, yeah, a week for three weeks. For an hour afterwards. Yeah, yeah, you couldn't go back to work after the treatment. So it just became this like, oh, this is a big and like I will forever be so <laughs> thankful um to Dan and Lindsay for like being so letting me do it. So gracious in that. Yeah, yeah. like there was not a problem, you yeah. know? And I think that I think that they knew you well enough at that point to know this. You wouldn't be asking to do it if it wasn't important. Yeah. Um, but so anyway, so we did all of that. That was over the summer. Mm -hmm. Um, you felt like that had really helped you. Yeah, I was, no and I then was noticing improvements. At that point, you were still drinking beer, pretty much only beer. Uh yeah. we didn't have like hard alcohol in the house. Mm -hmm. Um, and then we went home for Thanksgiving and you drank a lot of beer <laughs> uh, because my dad also drinks a lot of beer. So sure. there's always a lot of beer at the house. Yeah. And it's like, um, especially like when I'm around your dad, it's like, that's, uh, I don't know. It's a bonding thing. Whatever. Yeah. You know, yeah. it is. Um, and it definitely still bothered me at that point. Yeah. Um, and it felt like, God, dude, like you just drink a lot of beer. Yes, you know? Come on, man. Come on. Um, but you, it was like a couple days before we were going to leave. And, you were in the bathroom taking a shower, and I don't remember if you asked me to come in there or no. if I just walked in there. Yes, yes. Uh, but you were crying as you were getting out, and you yeah. were like, "I'm done. Mm -hmm. Like I am, I'm done drinking. I can't do it anymore." Mm -hmm. And I had heard you say that so many times that for me it was like, "Oh, I fucking hope so. Like I hope." Yeah. That that no, is I, I just, I don't know what it was. Could be the ketamine, could be the, a mix of things, but yeah, I was, uh, 
Yeah, I was in the shower and it was like just one of those moments where you're talking like to yourself. And remember I was having that conversation about learning to like step out of yourself and look at yourself as your own human to like love yourself. Like, yeah, I am something that I need to give love to. Yeah. And I just had this conversation of like, as a, I don't know, an amalgamation of talking to me. Cause again, on ketamine, I need to be very clear. The point of the therapy, at least, you know, for me and my experience is to disassociate. That is the point because that means it's doing its job. And when you disassociate, again, for me, I had no, there were times I had no clue of even the concept of what me was, what a is, is. It's hard to explain. You just have to go through it. It, it breaks down your concept of what anything is. And so for me, it's very important to have a, um, uh, a good playlist uh, something that can move you through the, it, for me, they're about an hour uh, journey. Uh, usually about an hour and a half, hour 45 of a total like time of like getting in. It's an IV, so they stick you in the arm. You're in a dark room. You're monitored the whole time. <clears throat> Again, at least for me. Um, and yeah, when you when you disassociate, from my experience, it is when I'm listening to music, especially, and I'd be happy to share my ketamine playlists, by the way, because I take them very seriously. Because if you have any, if you have the wrong thing, it could, it can take you in a place you don't necessarily, I see where, yeah, we're going a little bit long, but I'm okay with that on yeah. this one. Um, but a, a, a way I can explain it is if I'm, let's say I'm listening to something really beautifully cinematic with strings, it's very orchestral. Um, you don't hear the music. You are the music. Yeah. You feel like you are a sound wave in a sea of other sound waves. Yeah. Interlocking, making this. You feel what it's like to be other life. Mm-hmm. And I don't want to sugarcoat it because most of my experiences on on the whole have been uh, pl very pleasant and um, overall like uh, very visual and lovely. It's very, I love it. I do. I love going. Yeah. But I will say on my last one, I, I know that I went into it very stressed. I was in a not great place, I think. And... To be very candid, I that there was like a probably about a 10 minute period where I wasn't doing so well. And they actually had to come in and help calm me down and monitor because my heart started racing so much. Yeah. And I I felt like I was getting stretched through essentially a black hole. And then I ended up all the way through the universe into the tiniest pinpoint prick of like where time and space began. And I died. I felt death. And I remember uh, just like complete blackness, but not like you look around, it's like black. And then you look around, you see your hands are like, oh, I'm in the black. No, it's I am the blackness. And I remember trying to get my phone out and text you. And, and I remember the entities came in, they were shattered. It's like, you can't, they're not human. It's just a force. And so you feel there's something around you. And I knew something was, something was off. And in feeling like I was dying, this is what makes me feel comfortable. I think with dying now is, uh, there was one thing, and I know you already know, but there was one thing that kind of, helped me through that to like get through to say, oh, I'm not dying actually. And I was trying to get to my phone to text you. And in this space of nothingness, I was literally calling out like, like for you, I was looking for you. Yeah. And I remember going like, friend, love, help. <laughs> and in my like, I don't know. I think that's what makes me feel um, so certain that all that we have been through up to here is that you are 
the person for me because I was looking for... <laughs> oh, my God. Oh, my God. <laughs> yeah. Hey. <laughs> Damn it. That's very sweet. <laughs> yeah. Um... Yeah, it was very scary for me because it's the realest I can explain what dying and not the act like uh, I was dead. Like that's how it felt. Like yeah. I, I had I was on the other side. Yeah. And I was so desperately just trying to find you. And I think that's, that's sweet. <laughs> you kept me here. So and I know it's just chemical. I know I didn't actually die. I know it was just my brain telling me going yeah. through that process but it has it, that it scared me from like it's been a while since i've gone i think i I've, it's been like four or four or five months yeah probably and um i need to i do need to go back i think i'm gonna ask to dose down just a little bit to have a little easier ride i'm gonna change yeah. my music a little bit because again music really does guide you and i had a very emotional cinematic thing on yeah. And I, it, all of it, you know. Yeah. I think in my heart of hearts, I was going in there to to do work. And I think I did the work. It was just scary work. Yeah. But I still I still feel, even though it's, yeah, it has been four or five, six months, whatever it's been. I still feel those effects. Yeah. And they're not so blatant where you're just like, oh, I'm chipper now. No, it for me... I used to have these, I call them my darkies. Yeah. And they are you know, the, your dark clouds. You see them off in the distance and they start rolling in. And the closer they get, the heavier they feel. And then you just feel that, oof, that thick air. Yeah. And you can't get rid of this heaviness. And what I started noticing is you. I kind of look around and that heaviness is just like, oh, I I haven't had a bad thought this week. And I did. I haven't even had the thought that I haven't had a bad thought this week. Does that make sense? Yeah. And uh, so you just start to notice. Oh, I think I'm doing a little bit better just overall. Right. And yeah, I, I'm now yeah alcohol free. I still smoke a lot of weed. Just to be clear. Yeah. So when I say I'm sober, I'm sober from alcohol. Right. But um, yeah, I mean weed's my thing. Toto's my thing. <laughs> yeah. When I think that like for me, the the big takeaway that I hope people have after listening to this episode is I, I think a few things. Uh, one, uh, everybody goes through shit. And when we were, yeah, man. when we were in the darkest, hardest, poorest fucking times of our life, I mean, where we were... If we wouldn't have had family that was willing to lend us yeah. money, we would have been literally so fucked. Yeah. Like everybody's got this shit going on. And I think that we all think everyone else has got it figured out. Mm -hmm. And you're the only one that's struggling. And why the fuck is this so hard for me no, when we're all going when this person literally it's everybody. Everybody is doing it. Uh so if you're in a place where mm -hmm. you feel like you are just spinning your fucking wheels and you can't seem to get out of this hard spot just know we all feel that kind mm -hmm. of like all the time but also like things won't be hard always mm -hmm. they just won't you know like you'll figure out a way to kind of push through it or you'll refocus on things that you can control versus things that are out of control yeah um and i think also recognizing that we all cope with hard stuff in different ways yeah and if you choose, if your coping mechanism is alcohol or is something that hurts you or hurts your relationships, I would, I would really recommend looking at that and yeah. really thinking about what, what is this really doing for me? Because it might be allowing me to escape, but it's also hurting these relationships. Yeah. But also, I look at other, I look at people that struggle now, whether it's with drugs or alcohol and i'm like you have always at your core been a good person you're a good person you care about people you love people you it people matter to you yeah 
and you had this crutch for a long time. Yeah. But you were never a bad person. And I would I don't look at anybody now and think, you know, why can't they just stop doing that? Yeah. Because I've seen you and I've seen the struggle and the what those crutches provide you and the time when you feel like you need it. And then, you know, moving out of that now and living in a space that we live in where you're not using those crutches anymore and kind of seeing all of that, right? Like the growth from that. So I hope that people can have more empathy towards other people or if you are struggling with those things, I hope that you give yourself a little bit of grace. Um, but also recognize if what you're doing is hurting other people too. Because Logan's obsession now is Toto, which is annoying <laughs> and you know and drums uh, and yeah. Bothers me sometimes. Yeah. But I would rather listen to Toto on in the background of my life for every minute until I die than see Logan go back to an obsession that really hurt us. Yeah. Um, and, and then last, I think just, you know, Logan and I, we've been together for so long, but like it hasn't been a perfect ride, you know? No, it never is. And, and I think that we've had to really show up for each other in these different ways, which we've talked about before on the show about, yeah. you know, loving people in different ways where they're at. Um, but I think even, you know, when we separated, I truly thought, like, I'm done. I'm out. Mm -hmm. I wasn't ready to pull the trigger because I was worried about how you, you were going to take it. Uh and I was worried about what that meant for Oliver. But like me, when I said I was done, I was so done. Yeah. But I think because you recognized how serious I was and how bad it had gotten, and you put so much back into me that it like, I I fell in love with you all over again. Because I had lost that. Like I had just, I loved you as a person, but as a partner, I was like, this dude just like, it's not there anymore. Yeah. And so I hope that if you are in a relationship where you you see your partner struggling and you don't know if you can do it anymore, I think that it's important to recognize that you are worth you, you're worth having people have to change behaviors. Um, you know, I, I I shouldn't have had to to live with Logan as an alcoholic for our entire relationship. Um, just because I knew he was a good person or I knew he was a good dad or uh, or whatever. But like, I was, I'm worth having a sober partner. I'm worth having somebody that will give up a thing that isn't serving them well and is hurting us. Um, because if Logan would have continued down that road and I had stayed, I had never said anything. I don't know when you would have stopped. I think that I had to put my foot down and say, I'm not doing this with you anymore for you to take it seriously. Yeah. Um, so I hope that if you're in a relationship like that or you're feeling mm -hmm. that type of way, I hope that you feel like you're in a safe enough relationship to talk to your partner yeah. about that stuff and know that they might get angry. Uh, yeah. But at the end of the day, like... You deserve to have a healthy partner mm -hmm. and you deserve to have a partner that also is willing to see that like what they're doing is hurting you Yeah, and know that they don't, they would never want to do that to you. Yeah. I think as soon as it became so clear to you, how, how much you were hurting me and what you're doing, hundred percent. it's like, it doesn't matter, you yeah. know, like it doesn't matter how much I feel like I need this thing. <clears throat> I need my person more. So like, what do I have to do? So yeah. I hope that you are kind to yourself and you <laughs> are kind to your yeah. partner or anybody that you see that is struggling with this kind of stuff, but also yeah. um, stand up for yourself. Yeah, absolutely. And if I could end with just two pieces of advice that I would say were, I think, small but big at the same time for me that I think were crucial for me this last time to sticking with it. Number one was telling everybody close to me just how much uh, it meant to me that I was like committing to this. And that was that's accountability in my book. So I told, excuse me, I told Kate, I told my friends, 
I told my coworkers. I told, uh, you know, Dan and Lindsay. I told everybody that I could think because I knew if I tried to just do it myself, well, at least I had an out. If I fell off the horse, no one yeah. would know. No one would know because no one knew I was on the horse. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. No one knew. Well, no one knew I was fucking at horse camp throwing my fucking shitty pants into the woods. Yeah. Right. <laughs> <laughs> No, so accountability was huge for me because yeah. my ego wouldn't let – no, now they know. And if I fall off the horse, that's going to be embarrassing for me, mm -hmm. more embarrassing than being an alcoholic. Yeah. So that really worked. Number two, small but powerful, was a piece of advice by a good friend and comedian uh, – uh, well, he's not good friend. A very good person that I have come to know um, in the comedy world. His name's John Huck, um, funny comedian. Uh, we were at Dan's taping in Minneapolis last December, and I was smoking w weed with him out uh, in the um, alley. You were fresh on the uh, fr no alcohol A week train. and a half, I think. Yeah. Very, very fresh. Yeah. And, you know, it's a big night. It's Dan's biggest special. I was it's, so worried. It's his theater taping. I know. I wasn't. I, I thought for sure that you were going to I was off. a little nervous, but I wasn't super worried, actually. Yeah. Because I was... I had already told people I was bound to determined. No, I'm going to stick with this. I'm going to yeah. prove to them that yeah. I mean what I say. And again, this was a big special. It's Dan's first um, full like theater run. While wow, these big, beautiful, you know, historic theaters, uh, very awesome tour, and it was a success. And now his special actually comes out tomorrow. So by the time you hear this, please go check out uh, Dan Cummins' special on YouTube. It's I. I edited all the social videos for it and I was there for the taping. It's super awesome. Magical night. But when we were there, you know, backstage, there's fucking, I mean, nice ass bottles, five, six hundred dollar bottles of like right. delicious shit. Yeah. <laughs> and it's stuff where it's like, I don't know how often I'll have the opportunity to even just a little taste. So I can know that I had this right. rare alcohol or whatever. Or even there was stuff that wasn't rare. It's just like everybody else is like having a good time. Mm -hmm. One of our buddies in the green room while they were all drinking won an Emmy. He's like, guys, I just won an Emmy. <laughs> we're yeah. like, fuck. I, I felt so like of all the nights. Right. To have, I, Why didn't I quit two weeks later? Yeah. But if anything, that's the point, man. There's always going to be a reason for you to have not quit uh, a little bit later. Right. And for me, that was the biggest immediate, like, uh, world series of a test for me mm -hmm. was you're at literally in a, in a cool city. Uh, you're at this magical thing and every, like, it's there. It's free. You don't have to pay for it. <laughs> it's like all the things in my favor to want to drink this. And I didn't take a single sip because when I went out to talk to John and um, smoke that, joint which was really cool is the one of those glass tip ones which is i was my first time smoking those um i told him i was like yeah man i, I appreciate you because i don't like to travel with my weed i'm just a weird rule follower yeah. that way mm -hmm. and so i was trying to bum some off of him because like hey man like i need to be honest with you like i just quit drinking two weeks ago and i don't have any of my weed on me like do you mind if i he's like say no more and he was yeah. real gracious. And um, so we were smoking and he was like, hey man, like, you know, that's that's really cool. It's it's awesome. It's cool to be sober. Cause you know, John himself, uh, he got sober and he lost a lot of weight and he's look, he looks great. Yeah. And his biggest piece of advice for me was drink tea. Literally get yourself like a um I don't know, what do you, the hot pot, whatever. So you can like boil tea kettle? tea kettle. God damn it! <laughs> <laughs> so you, you can physically get up, make some hot water, steep your tea, and make a process of it. Because there's that tangible hand to mouth thing. Yeah. And it is a, it's an addiction. Mm -hmm. And so I tried that as soon as I got back because we have like the nice, you know, water, tea, coffee set up there in the office. I was like, you know what? I never really use this thing. Uh, I, I didn't, sorry, John, I didn't end up getting the tea kettle, but we have that thing. So I do, I still get up. You have like a hot water I thing. I still, I went out and got all my teas, got my honey, 
got my favorite mugs and I did the thing. And it, really for two, three weeks, I was probably five, six, maybe even seven or eight cups a day where I would get up and I was just like, let's just do this. And I almost made it a challenge to see like, can I make, can I do 10 today, you know? Yeah. Because it's water, you know, it's tea. <laughs> yeah. And man, that first initial hump, I think was bigger than I thought it was going to be. Yeah. Because once I got past that two or three week mark, hey, look at me, I'm drinking tea now and I like, I don't hate it. Mm -hmm. Um. And I have, I've moved on to now just water. I have my big, uh, well, one of these at work. And uh, I try to drink at least two of those a day, if not three. Uh, I've got little, you know, the squirt water or uh, flavor packet things. Yeah. Occasionally I'll still do tea because, you know, I, we still have it there. But if, if nothing else and you're looking, if you're someone like me and you're looking to try again, my advice is, even if it's just a few people close to you, just tell them, hey, I'm trying this thing. And and I really need the, the accountability support here because I think I can do it this time. And try the tea. It's, it, worst case, you'd find out you love tea. Yeah. Or you hate tea. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so. Yeah. But yeah, I think we've gone a little long. This is a good spot to end it. Yeah. I'm, I'm sure we'll get to more aspects of this later. Um, yeah. Yeah. Our clock is nine 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 now. So oh my god, <laughs> or fifth night. Yeah, um, yeah. Well, we are super happy you're here. Yeah. We care about every single one of you. We are so thankful. Um, if you haven't joined the Facebook group yet, I would really recommend that. Yeah. Um, I feel like people are starting to use it the way I think yeah, we want it to be. People are starting to be a little bit more used. vulnerable in yeah. there, and uh, it just is important for us to have this safe space. For people that don't feel like they have a support system at home yeah, uh, or, you know, a, a big friend group, uh, we just wanted to create a space where people could go to, like, vent or yeah. get advice from other people and just not feel judged. Yeah. Uh, and it's been it's been going pretty good, I think, up to this point. Yeah, I love that. Um, it's, it's small, but I think I like it. I want to keep it kind of, you know, I don't want it to be this 20,000 yeah. plus group right away like we have with some of the other ones because that's, it's immediate, like trolls just flood in. So if we slowly yeah. can grow this, if you know anybody who you think, I think this person might want to be in this group with me, yeah, do that. Don't mass invite everybody because, yeah, we're trying to keep it to the, to the purpose of yeah. what it is. Yeah. Um, if you have a story that you would like to send in, yeah. um, that is also a, a safe space. Mm -hmm. It's uh, me right now answering those. So uh, I promise to be gentle with you. Um, and the email for that is mylife at brokenyouthclub.com. Yep. Uh, there's the telephone number that you could call into. We'll just put it on the screen because we yeah. can never remember it. And we need to just write it down a plastic Starts somewhere. Starts with a five. <laughs> yeah, 509 something. All yeah, right. All right. Um, <laughs> but Yeah. We're just super happy you're here. Yeah. So, thanks uh, guys. Yeah. Okay. Love you. Bye. We'll see you next week.